My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin, and my subject is Trade Beyond the Roman Frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. I am a member of the Classical Association of Northern Ireland. The question is, did an African kingdom defeat the Roman Empire? This is part two of a lecture on the war between Meroe and Rome. For information on ancient Africa, see my book, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, Chapter 5, Beyond Egypt, The Nile Route and the African Kingdom of Meroe. In 27 BC, Augustus had three legions, approximately 15,000 troops stationed in Egypt. However, Many of these soldiers were transferred during the attempted Roman conquest of southern Arabia. This presented the rulers of Meroe with an opportunity to challenge Roman power in the region, and in 25 BC they launched a large-scale military attack against southern Egypt. The Greek author Strabo reports that the Ethiopians were emboldened because part of the Roman force in Egypt had been taken away to wage war against the Arabians. There was a small Roman garrison of three cohorts, perhaps 1,500 troops, stationed at Elephantine Island to maintain order in nearby Syene. King Tereticus of Meroe led 30,000 warriors north to the first cataract, where he attacked and pillaged Philae. The Marotic army overran Syene and stormed the garrison on the island destroying the symbols of Roman administration. Strabo, who was living in Alexandria, reports that the Africans enslaved the inhabitants and tore down statues of Caesar Augustus before retreating south with Roman prisoners and thousands of Egyptian captives. When the first reports of the attack reached Alexandria, the acting governor Petronius set out for the Egyptian frontier with a retaliatory force of 10,000 infantry and 800 cavalry. By then, the Marotic army had withdrawn to the city of Pelchis, Dhaka, 60 miles south of the first cataract. Petronius pursued them, sending envoys to question why they had begun a war and demanding the return of the captives. But the envoys found that there was nobody in command of the Marotic army. Tereticus had died suddenly of sickness or injury, and Marotic representatives told Petronius that the attack was in retaliation for abuses carried out by Egyptian nomarchs, administrators. They alleged that the officials had exceeded their established authority by enforcing unjust taxation. Petronius explained that the nomarchs were answerable to the Roman emperor, and would be punished for their transgressions. The representatives asked for three days to deliberate, perhaps hoping that the royal family in Meroe would send instructions. But when the time period lapsed without response, Petronius took the initiative and attacked Pelchis. Marotic warriors had assembled at Pelchis, each carrying a large oblong shield made of raw oxhide and armed with an array of axes, pikes, and swords. They outnumbered the Romans almost three to one, but Strabo reports that they were poorly marshalled and badly armed, compared with the heavily armoured, well-drilled legionary ranks. The Marotic forces were driven into retreat and fled into the city or to the desert. Some warriors escaped the battle by wading into the Nile at a fording point with few crocodiles, and where the river current was weak. They reassembled on a small island, but the Romans secured rafts and boats and crossed the river, taking them prisoner. Petronius captured several African generals who told him that a queen named Kendake had assumed power in Meroe. Inscriptions from Meroe suggest that Kendake was a royal title and possibly signified queen mother, as it appears alongside the Marotic word ruler. In this period, a queen named Amerenas is recorded as regent for a young prince named Akanadad, who resided in the city of Napata. 
Strabo describes her as a masculine sort of woman who is blind in one eye. Her masculine character could refer to her physical height or her commanding presence as a war leader. When Petronius learned that the Egyptian captives had been taken to Napata, he began the march south into unknown terrain. The Roman troops struggled across large sand dunes as they marched along the banks of the Nubian Nile. Almost midway, between the first and the second cataract, they reached the fortified town of Premnis, on a cliff-top overlooking the river. The Romans took the city with their first assault, then continued their march, seizing a succession of towns and expelling their morotic garrisons. As the Roman army approached Napata, Amanarenas sent messengers asking for an end to hostilities and offering to return the captives and the trophies taken from Sayene. Petronius dismissed the opportunity to negotiate and immediately attacked the city. A Canada had escaped, but hundreds of the city's inhabitants were seized for transportation to Egypt as slaves. By now the Romans had marched 870 miles south of Sayene, but were still more than 70 miles from the capital at Meroe. The African summer was approaching, and Petronius could not be certain what terrain lay ahead. He therefore decided that he had inflicted sufficient reprisals and returned to Egypt. Strabo reports, When they had burned Napata to the ground and enslaved its inhabitants, Petronius returned with the plunder. He determined that the regions beyond would be difficult to traverse. Diocasius adds, Petronius was unable to advance further on account of the sand and the heat. There was no advantage to be gained by remaining where he was with his entire force, so he withdrew, taking the greater part of the army with him. On his return, Petronius established a Roman garrison of 400 men on the cliff-top city of Premnus, leaving them with enough supplies for two years. The entire punitive military expedition was concluded in a matter of months. When Petronius returned to Alexandria, he sent reports and war trophies to Rome, including a thousand African prisoners. Peace seemed secured, with new territories added to the empire. But two years later, in 22 BC, Queen Amanarenas led a large army north to the Second Cataract. She did not, however, attack the fortress at Premnus, giving Petronius time to arrive with war machines and reinforcements. When Amanarenas learned that a senior Roman commander was present, she sent envoys to reopen negotiations. Amanarenas asked for a permanent peace settlement and requested more information about Rome. Petronius, perhaps mindful of the fate of Gallus, explained that her envoys would have to present their case directly to the emperor. The envoys claimed that they did not know who this Caesar was or where they could find him, so Petronius gave them escorts. At that time, Augustus was on the Greek island of Samos, formulating a permanent settlement with the Parthian Iranian Empire, and had just received ambassadors from India. The emperor treated the Marotic envoys favourably and granted all of Amanirenas' demands, including a Roman withdrawal from the Nubian territories claimed by Meroe. Strabo reports that when the ambassadors had obtained everything in their appeal, Augustus went further and remitted the tributes that he had imposed upon them. Perhaps Augustus had seized an opportunity to display his statesmanship or perhaps he recognised that Nubia would be difficult to garrison. Good diplomatic relations with Meroe also had a financial benefit, since the Romans could collect highly lucrative custom taxes on goods that crossed from Nubia into Egypt. By 20 BC, Roman troops had left the Nubian town of Premnus and withdrawn 60 miles north 
to Hera Sikaminos. The Marotic Kingdom reclaimed supremacy over the region and became responsible for protecting the Nile route from hostile desert tribes. It was a peaceful reoccupation, but Marotic warriors symbolically toppled and beheaded statues of the emperor in the reclaimed towns. One was placed beneath the threshold of a temple to the Marotic god of victory. In 1910, a team of archaeologists from Liverpool University discovered the bronze head in the ruins of ancient Meroe. It is now in the British Museum, and although the bright metal surface has tarnished, the coloured glass eyes still stare out, vivid and clear. At a shrine just south of Meroe, two large stone stela were found by the same archaeological team. The inscriptions commemorate a military victory, written in cursive Marotic script. Only the proper nouns can be deciphered. The panels commemorate the victory of Amerenas and Akanadad over Arme, Rome. In 1911, when British archaeologists were excavating a nearby temple, they unearthed wall paintings showing foreign prisoners brought to Meroe. The site of these ancient paintings has been destroyed by floods, but watercolour copies made by visiting scholars confirm details of the scene. The images show fair-haired, white-skinned captives dressed in tunic-like clothes, bound in chains and being made to kneel before a morotic deity. Between 1960 and 1970, the Aswan High Dam was built, and the Nile Valley between the first and second cataracts was flooded to create Lake Nasser. The clifftop fortress at Premnus remained as an island, and archaeologists have undertaken excavations at the site. Along with coins, lamps, papyri documents, and scraps of clothing, they found thousands of stone ballistae that had been delivered for the fortress catapults in the time of Petronius. The most extraordinary find amongst the Roman debris was a fragment of papyrus scroll, which is one of the oldest surviving manuscripts written in Latin. It contains a few lines of verse copied from the writings of Cornelius Gallus, the disgraced governor of Egypt. This document represents all that is left of his once celebrated works and refers to Julius Caesar's ambition to conquer Persia. Cornelius Gallus writes, My fortunes will be blessed, Caesar, when you dominate Roman history. When you return, I will admire the temples of many gods enriched with your trophies. Julius Caesar was assassinated by his colleagues before he could undertake any further conquests, and Cornelius Gallus was destined to suffer an ignominious death at his own hands. But some unknown soldier had carried these words as his inspiration in the dry heat of ancient Premnus. Despite these military ambitions, the Roman emperors could not conquer Persia, and Rome never extended its rule into sub-Saharan Africa. For further information, see my book, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, subscribe to my channel, and follow the link below this video. Thank you.